Jerusalem is centered around three valleys and mountains. The mountains are Mount Moriah, sometimes called the Eastern Mountain, the Western Mountain, sometimes called Mount Zion, and Mount of Olives. Out of these three mountains, Mount Moriah was chosen as the best location for building a city. Although the western mountain is much larger and less steep, Mount Moriah was chosen because it had one unique and necessary element for the city to survive in this dry climate. Water. Water is priceless in the desert and the Gihon life-giving stream which ran from beneath Mount Moriah was something very special. With a continually flowing source of water and protection in the form of hills, Mount Moriah was established as the best place for the first human settlements in this area. Besides the mountains, the valleys also surround the city, which are dry basins of rivers that may periodically turn into waterways during heavy rainfall. And so, to the east we have the Kidron Valley, in the middle is the Tyropean Valley, sometimes called the Central Valley, and lastly, to the west, the Hinnon Valley. When we look at the shape of all those three valleys, people who know Hebrew may have associations with the Hebrew letter Shin, when they look at the shape. The story of Jerusalem in the Bible begins with Abram and Melchizedek. Abram met Melchizedek king of Salem after a military victory over the king of Eliam, mentioned in Genesis 14. During the excavations in the city of David, archaeologists found no walls from the period when Salem was a city. Salem is often interpreted as the city of peace and therefore no walls were needed. Abraham returns to Salem later on in his life. In Genesis 22:2, we read, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And then, in Genesis 22, 4-5, we read, Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. God says to Abraham that the sacrifice will happen on a mountain that will be shown to him. Abraham knew Salem because in Genesis 14, Abraham met Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem. We also read that the place chosen by God was up on a mountain. Abraham had to look up to see it. In ancient times, places of worship were built on mountain tops. Above Salem was Mount Moriah, where the future Jewish temple will stand. We read that Abraham leaves his servants with a donkey, probably in the nearby city of Salem. After a long journey, the servants probably stayed in Salem and gave water to their donkey. The story ends with God providing a ram for the sacrifice and Isaac's life is spurred. We return to Mount Moriah in the Bible in the times of the Jewish conquest of the Holy Land. Jerusalem at this time is no longer Salem but is referred to as Jabez in which the Canaanite people live. The eastern hill was again chosen as the perfect place to settle because of the Gihon Spring. Water on the desert is a true miracle and a source of life. The ancient people knew this well and built walls 
and huge towers stretching down the hill to protect the very source of the spring. On top of the city, the Jebusites built the Citadel of Zion, supported by a brick pyramid. Today, we know this is true because huge stones have been found and bear witness to the massive tower that protected the spring. Even today, the Gihon Spring is still gushing out water from beneath the rocks. This is one of the proofs showing where the city of David was located. Around the spring, foundations of buildings have been found that continued to function throughout David's reign and up to their destruction in 586 by the Babylonian Empire. The Canaanite Jerusalem had a holy site above outside the city walls. They worshipped in the area of the Temple Mount, which later became the holiest site for the Jews and the third most holy site for Muslims. After seven years of reign in Hebron, King David takes up the challenge that will seal his name as Israel's most famous ruler in history. To do this, he must conquer Jebus city, which does not belong to the tribe of Israel. The problem is that many armies have already tried to capture this fortress, but the massive walls and the elevated location made the city seem invincible. David knew that traditional methods of fighting would not work miracles here. Many armies have tried, and yet, they have not captured the fortress. How then David, with his small army, conquered the city? Perhaps the hint is in one of the words that the Bible uses. In the second book of Samuel 5.8, we read, And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter, and smiteth the Jebusites, and the lame and the blind, that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. The text key word is Bat Zinor, which appears only once in the entire Bible and means tunnel, canal, or pipe. When David sees the mighty walls, he knows that capturing the city will require a special tactic. Perhaps by getting information from his spies, David learns about a secret passage to the city, leading through one of the water tunnels. Joab volunteers for this dangerous mission and decides to break into the city using one of the entries at the mountain's foot. Today, the same tunnels are used by millions of tourists visiting the city of David. The most famous is the so-called Hezekiah Tunnel built in Hezekiah's reign. The biblical text shows that the tricky tactic was successful. Joab gets into the city and probably opens the gates to the city, resulting in a great victory for David. David builds a palace for himself in the place of the Zion fortress and an additional protective walls. Today at the palace site on the so-called Milo, archaeologists have found fragments of columns from David times and the robust foundations of a large building. The palace was situated on a hill from where David could observe his subjects including a woman named Bathsheba. After bringing the Ark of the Covenant, David wants to build a temple for God, but his warrior past disqualifies him, and building a house for God must wait for his son Solomon. However, the temple site is purchased from the Jebusite Aruna, where an altar to God is built. David conquered Jerusalem 
and made it the capital of all the tribes of Israel. But it was in the time of Solomon that Jerusalem acquired the status of a perfect city. Solomon's name comes from the Hebrew word Shalom, which means peace and completeness. Most often, Bible scholars portray Solomon as the figure who built the temple for the God of Israel. But the temple is just a crown on the head of a mighty construction project that show this legendary king's glory and wisdom. In Solomon's day, Jerusalem population and area doubled. During his reign, Solomon built the forest of Lebanon, the column hall, the throne room, the royal palace, the court, and of course, the legendary temple. Here is a description of the magnificent throne of Solomon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. The throne had six steps and the top of the throne was round behind and there were stays on either side of the place of the seat and two lions stood beside the stays and twelve lions stood there on the one side and on the other upon the six steps. There was not the like made in any kingdom. Unfortunately, after Solomon's death, the king Rehoboam did not step up to his father's legacy. Rehoboam almost instantly destroyed what his father had worked for in his lifetime. Rehoboam was unwise and started listening to friends of his youth rather than the advisors that Solomon left for his guidance. Rehoboam quickly taxed the northern tribes of Israel so heavily that they rebelled and separated themselves from Judah, choosing Jeroboam as their new king. The kingdom became divided into Israel and Judah, having their own kings, capitals, and worship centers. The capital of Judah, Jerusalem, gradually started to lose its significance internationally and had many kings that led the Jewish people into idolatry. Certainly, the downfall of Judah would be much quicker if not for the good kings that fought for the restoration of pure worship. One of such kings was Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, and the 13th king of Judah. He is considered a very righteous king in both the Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles. Because of the limited space in the city of David, people started to settle outside the city walls. The population of Jerusalem grew and people needed new space to build their homes. Quickly, new homes started to pop up on the western hill, especially after the destruction of the northern kingdom by Assyria, refugees fled to live in Jerusalem. Hezekiah, understanding the need to protect the people from the danger of the invaders, builds a massive seven meter wide wall around the new neighborhood. What is astonishing is that today you can see the uncovered parts of this wall in Jerusalem. Another important construction project by Hezekiah was the creation of the Pool of Siloam that provides water for the growing population of Jerusalem. The Pool of Siloam became very important in Jewish tradition and is also visible in the New Testament description of Jesus' ministry. In the Bible, we read a lot about the creation of this water reservoir. This project was possible thanks to the creation of a new water tunnel that would direct the water from the Gihon Spring to the Pool of Siloam. As the Assyrian invasion was closing on Jerusalem, Hezekiah and his army generals decided that it is necessary to block the water coming out of the city of David. 
In 2 Chronicles, we read, It was Hezekiah, who stopped the upper outlet of the waters of Gihon, and directed them, to the west side of the city of David. The old Canaanite tunnel was blocked, and the water stopped flowing into the king's gardens. Hezekiah diverted the spring's water into a new underground tunnel that has been quarried into the heart of the mountain. Two groups of masons worked towards each other from both sides and met in the middle of the tunnel. The evidence of this ancient miracle of engineering was found inside the tunnel on the Siloam inscription. Today, you can see a copy of the inscription inside the ancient tunnel of Hezekiah. The new walls and tunnels enhanced Jerusalem protection, but it was not enough to stop Assyria. Assyria was not just another enemy of Judah. At the end of the 8th century, Assyria became the first true empire. Assyria inherited culture, science and religion that developed in the Babylonian Empire, but improved on military art. They were a force that no one could resist. Assyria conquered Israel's northern kingdom, destroying its cities and deporting the ten tribes of Israel to foreign lands. Now, this unstoppable force was heading towards Judah to complete the destruction of the Jewish kingdom. Living in the times of Hezekiah, the people of Jerusalem had to be terrified of the news that Assyria is heading towards Jerusalem. On their triumphal march, the army of Sanherib destroyed 46 fortified cities and approached the great city of Lachish. The brutality of the Assyrian army against the people of Lachish perhaps did reach the Jerusalem citizens. What would they hear? Nothing pleasant. Perhaps stories of mass murder, stories of cutting the limbs, noses and ears of their captives, stories of people being skinned alive, beheaded, stretched on torture machines and of people's mutilated bodies impaled on stakes. The fate of Lahish was very tragic indeed. King Sanherib is so proud of his demolition in Lachish that he orders a 12 meter long relief describing all the horrors of the battle and putting it in his palace in Nineveh. We can only imagine the horror of the people of Jerusalem who must have thought that they are next. The very event of the Jerusalem siege is well recorded in the Bible. The army of Assyria stands outside the Jerusalem walls, threatens Hezekiah, mocks the God of Israel and warns the people of their painful death. Jerusalem army, its walls, are no match for the war machine that conquered cities like this. There seems no hope and there is no place to escape. Hezekiah understands this well and turns to God as his last hope for survival. In 2 Kings chapter 19 we read, It is true, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands, and have hurled their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but only the work of human hands, wood and stone. So they have destroyed them. But now, Lord our God, please, save us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. The Bible records that the God of Israel is not silent to Hezekiah's prayer and answers through the mouth of the prophet Isaiah. And against whom have you raised your voice? Against the Holy One of Israel. Because of your raging against me, and because your complacency has come up to my ears, I will put my hook in your nose, and my bridle in your lips, 
and I will turn you back by the way by which you came. God answered Sanherib in those words. The next day the army of Sanherib was destroyed. He is forced to return to Nineveh where he is murdered in the temple of the pagan god Nishroch. For many years this biblical story was regarded as a fairy tale in the Bible. However, in 1830 archaeologists in Iraq found the so-called Sanherib's prism. On this hexagon prism the same expedition recorded in the Bible could be read in the Akkadian language. Regarding the Sanherib's expedition to Judah, Sanherib records all the cities he conquered and demolished, but when he starts to describe the Jerusalem siege, we can see a sudden change of narrative. Instead of describing how he destroyed Jerusalem like the other cities in Judah, we read, Hezekiah himself, like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. Of course, the proud leader did not write that his whole army got killed and he was forced to return, but at least he did not lie, he had to return. He did not conquer Jerusalem. In the Sanherib's prism there is no explanation of why Jerusalem was not conquered, but the Bible says it was an angel sent by God. This is truly a remarkable story. Once again the Bible proves to be a reliable source and a witness of God's sovereignty even over the most powerful people in the world. Sanherib, who thought he was the king of the world, who humiliated many nations and their deities, now faced a force that cannot be mocked. Just one angel of the Lord destroyed his magnificent army. Instead of seeking the truth, Sanherib turns back to his false gods and is murdered by his sons in a pagan temple. There is no Assyria today, but Israel is still a nation and a people of God. And so we come to the end of today's episode. This episode was a summary of the episodes I did in the past. I provide more information in the original episodes, so if you did not see them, I am leaving a link to the playlist in the description. In the second episode in this series, we will cover the period from Nehemiah to the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, so don't mess it out. Thank you for your attention, I hope you enjoyed this episode. As always, I encourage you to comment. You can also subscribe to this channel to stay informed about the next monthly episodes on Jerusalem's history. You can also support this channel by clicking the join button on my main page. This will certainly help me to improve. Have a great day and see you soon!